brothers and sisters in Christ, we are now in the Cathedral of the Good Shepherd, Singapore, and so let us begin.
prayers for forgiveness and healing before the Blessed Sacrament. Dear brothers and sisters, as we are before the Lord, who is present to us in the Blessed Sacrament, truly and physically, after each prayer, let us allow the words to sink into our hearts. Heavenly Father, I come before you with an open heart to receive your graces, to forgive those who have hurt me deeply. May you heal me and give me the strength to be more like you at all times. Forgive me for the times when I have taken your love and mercy for granted. Heavenly Father, you know my needs, and you feel my pain, trials, and helplessness. Be my strength and my hope, so that I can forgive as you forgive, and find the peace of seeing and loving you in every person daily. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, let us begin with our guided contemplation of the Gospel. To familiarize with the Gospel text for our contemplation, I will now read the Gospel of St. John, chapter 15, verses 1 to 8, in which Jesus proclaims, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus said, I am the true wine, and my Father is the wine dresser. Every branch in me that bears no fruit, he cuts away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes to make it bear even more. You are pruned already 
by means of the word that I have spoken to you. Make your home in me as I make mine in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit all by itself, but must remain part of the vine, neither can you unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever remains in me, with me in him, bears fruit in plenty. For cut off from me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is like a branch that has been thrown away, he withers. These branches are collected and thrown on the fire, and they are burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask what you will, and you shall get it. It is to the glory of my Father that you should bear much fruit, and then you will be my disciples. The Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters in Christ, I will now highlight a few aspects of the gospel that we just heard proclaim to help us have a better understanding and appreciation of God's word and also to prepare our hearts for our guided contemplation prayer. In today's gospel, Jesus proclaims words of great and divine wisdom to his disciples in using the image that he is the vine. His father is the vine dresser and all disciples are branches. Jesus explains very clearly that unless we are united with him, who is the vine, and we as branches, we will not bear fruit. And if we as branches should choose to cut off from him, we will wither and die. And it's only fit to be thrown into the fire to be burned. However, those disciples who chooses to remain united with him as the vine will draw strength and inspiration to continue his work of proclaiming and witnessing to the good news of salvation. His father, the vine dresser, who is united with him as the vine, will prune our branches so that we can all bear fruit in plenty. Such pruning are the challenges and the trials of living the faith, and they are needed for us to deepen and mature our relationship with Him, who is the vine. Pruning that the Father does and allows in our lives come in many ways. But we as the branches and disciples must fully trust in the Father's love for us. We must firmly believe that the Father will never allow us to suffer pain and trials that are unnecessary for our salvation and eternal life with Him. So Jesus urges His disciples and us, make your home in me as I make mine in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit by itself, but must remain part of the vine. So my sisters and brothers in Christ, you and I are called to continue to open our minds and hearts daily and in every possible way, build a personal relationship with Jesus and deepen our love for God our Father. Jesus makes this very clear when he said, a branch cannot bear fruit all by itself, but must remain part of the vine. My sisters and brothers in Christ, our reflection on our life's experiences tell us that regardless of how talented, intelligent and successful we may be in our career or in our achievements in the secular world, these in themselves, without them being united to Jesus the vine, cannot bring the plentiful fruits that lead us to receiving the gifts of eternal happiness and salvation. However, if all that we live for daily, and if all our secular and materialistic possessions and successes are attributed to God's graces and blessings, 
and if they are used for the good of God's kingdom, then we can associate these secular successes and wealth with the fruits that are united with Jesus the vine and with God our Father the vine dresser. This then is living our lives according to what Jesus in today's gospel says to you and to me. To the glory of my Father, that you should bear much fruit, and then you will be my disciples. My brothers and sisters in Christ, before we enter into the guided contemplation proper, I urge you to switch off your mobile phones and set up a conducive ambience for your prayer. Please also note that as I guide you along during the contemplation, follow me only if you find what I say to be helpful to your prayer. But if the Holy Spirit is guiding you in some personal way that is different from mine, then simply ignore what I'm saying. Please note too that there will be moments of silence which are deliberate. These moments are very important parts of the contemplation. They are to give you the sacred space to listen to and feel the promptings of the Holy Spirit, however this may be. And if you wish to have more details of the structure of this guided gospel contemplation, and also listen to the introduction of this series, please click to the link at the bottom. And so, my sisters and brothers in Christ, having prepared ourselves to familiarize with the gospel text that we are to contemplate on, we can now begin our contemplation. Let us begin by composing ourselves. Please switch off your mobile phones, close, close your eyes, sit upright, and focus your attention on your nostrils. Become aware of your breathing. The air that is entering your nostrils and giving you life. <clears throat> Every breath you take is God's precious gift of life to you. Be grateful to God for the gift of life. For as soon as we stop breathing, we will die. God is present within your heart and is lo loving you personally and intimately. Thank the Lord. Prayer to pray for the graces we need for our contemplation. Heavenly Father, we pray that during this contemplation, you would give us the grace to build and deepen our personal relationship with your Son, our Lord, and to love you ever more dearly and faithfully. Imagine yourself at the scene where you are with Jesus and his disciples. You are seated under the shade of a huge tree. 
in the cool of the late afternoon. You feel the fresh breeze of the countryside blowing into your face. As you are relaxing and enjoying each other's company, Jesus then catches your attention and says, My brothers, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that bears no fruit, he cuts away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes to make it bear even more. Hearing this from Jesus, you are sure that deep within your heart, you desire to remain united with Jesus as you love him very much. Yet at the same time, you know your weakness and at times when you have disappointed Jesus in the wrong choices that you have made. And you feel sad about having hurt Jesus whom you love. Pause and ponder over those moments again and get in touch with your inner feelings.
you look up at Jesus who was sitting opposite you with guilt and sadness. But as Jesus looks at you, he knows what you are feeling. At the same time, you can see that Jesus' heart is so full of love and mercy and compassion for you. And you know he loves you in spite of your weaknesses and for the times when you have saddened him. Jesus then adds, as you and the other disciples are listening intently, Jesus says, make your home in me as I make mine in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit all by itself, but must remain part of the vine and will bear fruit in plenty. You know what Jesus has just said is filled with great and divine wisdom. You know that when you try to live by your own will and ways, independently of Jesus, your life gets confused. And your relationships with people you love become tense and fill with trials. But when you live in Jesus' love and trust in his Father's providence, you find peace, joy, 
and fulfillment in your life. So Jesus says, But if you remain in my love, you will glorify my Father. You will bear much fruit, and then you will be my disciple. Become conscious that you are in your room where you are praying. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may open your eyes now. My brothers and sisters in Christ, St. Ignatius of Loyola reminds us that soon after our contemplative prayer, we are to do a review of our prayer experiences. This review only needs to take some five minutes or so. The purpose of this review of prayer is to recall and relish what happened during the prayer. To get in touch with your inner feelings during the contemplation and describe our experiences. As such, click the pause button now. Close your eyes and spend the next few minutes making a review of your contemplation prayer. My brothers and sisters in Christ, just before we end, may I bring your attention again to those of you who are not yet familiar with this guided contemplation form of prayer and would like to have a greater clarity of the meaning and steps of how to pray this form of prayer. If so, then please click the button below this video for the details. I strongly believe that if you keep trying to pray this guided contemplation prayer, you would soon be familiar with it and will reap the fruits of the Spirit that will lead you to encounter Jesus in a very personal way through the contemplation. Take one patient step at a time and God will soon provide you with beautiful and profound experiences of Him in ways that you have never experienced before. We shall now move on to the next part of our session which is the benediction.
have given them bread from heaven. Having in itself all delight. Let us pray. O God, in this wonderful sacrament, left us a memorial of your passion. We ask you to enable us so to worship the sacred mysteries of your body and blood, that we may constantly feel in our lives the effects of your redemption. You who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in our earlier part, 13, we reflected on the reality that regardless of who we are and how old we may be, every person has to face the reality that one day we are sure to die. Our life here on earth is a passing reality as every human person is a finite human person. We also pointed out that whether a person considers the topic of death to be taboo, as though it would bring them bad luck when they talk about death, or whether we are anxious or fearful about the topic, death is the surest thing that is going to happen to everyone. Moreover, we also highlighted that no person can be sure as to when death is going to spring on us, as we are all finite human beings. And as such, an eventuality is beyond our control. Regardless of whether we are the poorest of the poor or the richest of the rich in the world, our reflection without going into the discussion of how different religions view death, we deliberated on two general views about death. The first view is the secular view of life. In this view, a person denies the reality of death. However, in the second view of death from the Christian faith, we affirm death as a reality. My sisters and brothers in Christ, if a person denies the reality of death and also denies the reality of the existence of God and thus how God wants us to live our lives as unimportant and irrelevant and if such a person 
were to be consumed by the materialistic gains, glory and glamour of this world, as in the true story of Matthew in sections 10 and 11, then such a person would very likely live a self-centred lifestyle that is ego-centred, proud and arrogant in one's attitude and behaviour. And we all know that such a lifestyle can never bring deep peace, meaning, fulfilment and happiness in one's life. This is because when God created the human person, He created every person in His own image and likeness, which is love. The first letter of St. John chapter 4, verse 7 to 8 says, I quote, my dear people, let us love one another since love comes from God and everyone who loves is begotten by God and knows God. Anyone who fails to love can never have known God because God is love." Unquote. God is the fullness and plenitude of love and as you and I are created from such fullness of love, there is a natural and innate deep desire in every human heart first to love God and then also to love one another. This means that not to love God and not to love one another is not a natural desire. Not to love are temptations and tendencies. As such, we cannot say that it is natural that we do not wish to love God or not to love others. And as such, we have to admit with humility that if we cannot find God's love within our hearts, then it is no wonder that we would find it very difficult to forgive people who have hurt us and to show true compassion, respect and mercy to the poor and marginalised in the world. And we can so easily fall into the narrow thinking of simply brushing aside this multitude of people and simply categorise them with the rest of the masses of the nobodies of this world, whether they are migrants or refugees or unwanted babies, which are then subjected to being exploited and abused unjustly without much guilt, as they are not seen and respected as God's precious children, and we, their brothers and sisters in Christ. My sisters and brothers in Christ, if a person does not believe that God exists, and that God is irrelevant in one's life, and that every person is not a child of God, and freely chooses to live a self-centered, self-gratifying and self-glorifying lifestyle, then we can also very well imagine that such a person would be terrified about their death. This is because for such a person, death would be a cruel disaster that will strip them from everything that they possess and value, including their families, at the instant of their death. They would in all probability see death as a great threat that will destroy all that they have built and accumulated during their earthly life. And at the instant of death, because they do not believe in a life after death, then to them death would also be like being plunged into the bottomless abyss where the darkness would envelop and swallow them up without any prospects of finding any consolations, hope and light. If this is their view of death, 
it is not surprising that death to them is the most threatening and horrifying thing to face in one's life. And as such, the logical reaction to such a darkness and helplessness in their life is to choose to indulge in all forms of secular enjoyment and gratification of life in the materialistic and secular sense of what is referred to as wine, woman and song and at the same time, out of fear of death, do what is necessary to prolong their life for as long as they can, in the hope that they can live to a very ripe old age. In all of such anxieties and fear, they also have to live as though death will not come too soon, or get used to thinking and denying that death is not a reality and sadly also reject God and His love and reality during their lifetime. My sisters and brothers in Christ, let us draw upon the consolation that you and I and indeed those who believe in Jesus as our Lord and Saviour, that we do not have to face such a terrifying and horrifying death. And this brings us to the second type and view about death. In this view, the reality of death is returning to our God, who created us out of love and living with Him for all eternity. The best examples of such type of person are the martyrs and saints, whose love for God is so deep that they even willingly suffer and die for their faith, knowing that their pain and suffering while on earth would only be temporary, while their life in heaven with God would be eternal. We know that 11 out of 12 apostles died a martyr's death, and even with great humility. St. Peter is known to have asked that he be crucified upside down because he is unworthy to be crucified in the same upright position as Jesus, who is his Lord and Saviour. My brothers and sisters in Christ, you would remember that in session 12, we reflected on the true story of Stephen Tan, who went to heaven soon after he died, and then from heaven, communicated to his dear wife that while he was on earth, he was actually looking forward to live a life of full happiness with God in heaven. Note too, that holy people who have a deep and personal love for Jesus, while they long to be with Jesus and God our Father and the Spirit, and indeed with Mary and all the saints, and angels in heaven, their daily living is very grounded, self-sacrificing, and filled with Christ-like virtues. They are far from being fundamentalists in the living of their faith. In fact, they are far from living a life of fantasy, or of wanting to live in heaven, and not loving others in their daily living. On the contrary, it is their deep and intimate love for Jesus that gives them the great desire to live with Him for all eternity in heaven. I know of many people who died very peacefully. When I visited them and administered the sacrament of the sick to them, they would smile at me and would tell me, Father, thank you for coming. I am at peace and I'm ready to meet God. These are people whom we know have lived a very wholesome life, a life of deep faith and love for God and others in their lives. In fact, 
I know of many holy people whom I have no doubts that when they die, they will go straight to heaven and bypass purgatory. Let us also remember that these people are in many ways like us. They are certainly not people who are perfect and pure and without sins. Other than Mary, the mother of Jesus, there are no such perfect persons in this world. No, these people are very grounded and they truly love God deeply. They, like you and I, would have their weaknesses and like St. Peter who denied Jesus out of fear and St. Thomas who doubted Jesus' resurrection unless he could put his finger into the wounds of Jesus. However, deep in these people's heart, it is evident that they are people who are very grateful to God and do not take God for granted. These holy people are fully aware that all that they are today and what they have are all blessings that have come from God. Even though they have their fair share of their pains and trials in their lives. And because they love God so deeply and so gratefully, they are the most selfless, compassionate, forgiving and humble people I know. They are those who make great sacrifices for the good of others out of their love and they also are the most generous with everything that they have. You could say that even though they are not perfect, they live their lives to the full and as best as they could, like Jasmine in our earlier true story. They love God with sincerity, simplicity and humility that even when people hurt them deeply, as in the case of Jasmine in our earlier story, they were able to forgive and transcend their deep hurts and pain and always sow unity and peace in family instead of being the cause of dissension and division in their family and amongst others. As they genuinely practice their faith with great fidelity, devotion and love. My sisters and brothers in Christ, I personally know of many such wonderful and holy people and I am personally so edified and encouraged by their love for God in the way they live their daily lives. It is such an honour and blessing to be working, relating and knowing such people. For to me, such people would certainly, like Stephen, Jasmine and others, would bypass purgatory and find themselves immediately at the gates of heaven as soon as they die. My brothers and sisters in Christ, as I conclude, let me reiterate that these people whose love for God is so deep and real that they would not only die in peace, but would die with deep gratitude in their hearts for all the blessings that they have received during their lifetime. They are people who are detached from all the material wealth and possession, not only at their time of death, but also during their lifetime. They share their wealth because their true security is in God. And they see their material wealth as blessings that have come from God. As such, they rightly share them with people in need for the church and indeed with many others. For to them, wealth is a means God has blessed them with to bring happiness to others. And to them, the greatest and the most precious gift that they treasure most is the gift of faith in Jesus, who is their Lord and Saviour. They have lived their life that God has given them to the fullest possible and Christ-like ways. 
even though they are not perfect but always humble enough to admit their faults failures and sinful ways and are always sincerely willing to try very genuinely and selflessly to love god in the way they live finally i would like to add that for such people of faith that you and i are called to be inspired by these people rightly so do not fear death to them death is returning to god whom they have loved so much during their earthly life indeed for them death is the joy of experiencing the transition of their lives from this world into a newly transformed life of living in god's presence and glory for all eternity so i look forward to having you in our next session 15 as we continue our journey of reflecting on how you and i can live a more discerning life that god wills of you and of me god bless you Heavenly Father as we come before your son Jesus our Lord who is physically and truly present to us in this blessed sacrament we ask you to continue to give us the wisdom the light the love to desire to transcend all our challenges and pains and trials of life to live your will so that we can finally live with you for all eternity after our life on earth comes to an end so we pray that you give us the graces and the light and love to live your will with greater generosity of heart as we pray lord teach me to be generous teach me to serve you as you deserve to give and not to count the cost to fight and not to heed the wounds to toil and not to seek for rest to labor and not to ask for reward save that of knowing i do your most holy will amen